It's a mama singing songs about the Lord It's a daddy spending family time The world says he cannot afford These simple moments change the world It's a pastor at a tiny little church Forty years of loving on the broken and the hurt These simple moments change the world Dream small Don't buy the lie, you've got to do it all Just let Jesus use you where you are One day at a time Live well Loving God and others as yourself Find little ways where only you can help With His great love A tiny rock can make a giant fall Dream small The start of the church really began uh, in the early 70s. It was a great Jesus movement then. I don't think there's been one since. As we go back, it's really going back to that it was a Saturday night. I remember it was a wee hours of the night and pastor was not pastor at that time. He was a man that was very broken, but God gave him that dream. And in that dream, he saw himself crying. And he was standing before those doors that seemed like almost impossible to open. He remembers, he says, pushing those doors to open them because he wanted so much to see what was on the other side of those doors. And he said he couldn't open it. So he heard the voices like angels singing. He kept saying, he kept hearing saying, Jesus is the key. Jesus is the key. And he said that when he heard that, all of a sudden he looked up and there was a beautiful key coming down from nowhere like it was just just there and he says and when that key came down he just saw that key go into the door and the door just opened he says and when the door opens he just felt the prison of the Lord take him in it just took him in and he woke up he woke up and from that day on I have to say he was never the same but I remember him waking me up it must have been about three in the morning he goes, Chata, the Lord came, the Lord is here, the Lord is real. And really, you know, you wake somebody up at that time and say something like that, you're not going to think it's the most spiritual thing because you don't know those things. All you're thinking is, this guy's not there no more, you know. So, but in time, I started realizing that it was a visitation from the Lord. The Lord had truly visited him. Both of us, without realizing it, uh, we had a salvation experience. Myself in my home, he in his home, and when we came together for work one day, we found out we both had had an experience with Jesus Christ. They got saved June of 1973. On the same night, they both got saved. So they went to work the, that Monday morning, and they just started sharing their experience. Hey, I got saved too. And they were just, you know, comparing them different, just at home. They got saved in the home. They became Christians. And I think what's so beautiful about all that is that it didn't stop there. Because people have visions, people have dreams, people, it was so real because it was the presence of God. And Pastor, from that time on, he would not let up. And you know, even though his wife was not believing, he would not let up. He was at the doors in the barrio, knocking on people's doors. I was getting calls from people crying. What is wrong with Gene? How come he's doing that? Why is he going around talking to everybody? He was so excited and he wanted other ones to know that the Lord was real. And he didn't know what to do with it. I saw it because he had never picked up a Bible. So in time what happened is that he realized he had to know what was going on and the Lord took him to the Bible. He was at work and he remembers coming home opening the Bible, and he came to that part. Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter. And he, I remember seeing him just crying, and he realized what had happened. He had been born again by the Spirit of God. Pastor Ray stood out. He looked like a light bulb just lit up. He was a baby Christian. He wasn't even a year old in the Lord. And he, he was just like, I couldn't believe it. I never really knew Christians. I was way back. And um, 
he just looked so different. He was lit up like a light bulb. He was so concerned for his family, which was me and Joanne. I didn't have Mark and Aaron yet. And he started looking. He started going places. Him and Pastor Emmanuel started with them working together. They started looking for a place. They wanted to know what was true. And what happened is they would go to places, they would hear, because at that moment, at that time, the Holy Spirit was moving in a lot of churches. People were being saved. That was in 1973, and people were being saved. And so what happened, they found King of Glory. Pastor worked in the, in the post office. He was asking the Lord for something. Please give me a place. He dropped a letter. He was sorting the, the letters. And the letter fell. He came, picked it up, and it said, King of Glory. And he said, okay, Lord, I'll try this church. Two little families with Joanne and Yvonne were little kids. Her and I were both expecting. I believe that when we walked into King of Glory together, we were nervous. It was strange, but we found out when we were there that that church had been praying for the audio, for the Hispanic community. And you see God's divine appointment. Here were these two little Mexican guys that came into like an all-white church. There was one Hispanic man there, Gabby, and they were praying for Northtown. And here comes these two guys. I'll share a vision he had that he said he knew he was going to be coming to the ministry. We were maybe two or three months in the Lord, and he walked to the backyard of our other house in Cucamonga. And he walked back there and he said the Lord gave him, he literally saw, it was a vision, he said it was a vision. He said he saw a multitude of seats, of chairs. He said he even saw faces that are still with us. Faces of people that hadn't even been saved. He said he saw them and he goes, where are we going to put all these people? And he said, Lord, how am I going to do it? You want me to minister to these people? And that's when he knew. He knew that already what God had shown him, that it was going to really happen. Because God gave him that vision. He said, where are we going to put all these people? And he saw his sister Licha. He saw Francis. He saw Puka. He saw people. He said, there was a lot of people. He goes, but I remember seeing their faces. And he said, when I came back in, I remember him coming back in. He goes, Chata, the Lord is going to, us in the ministry. Myself and Ray, when we first got saved, any seemed like anywhere we went, anybody we talked to, people were getting saved. You know, a lot of people were getting saved. And example, uh, Francis and Eddie Amatoy. They would they would share what happened to them. My wife uh, was spoken to by her sister, which is the pastor's wife, Anita, and she accepted Christ. So she was with this group of people, which I called the Wild Bunch. Wherever they would go, they were not afraid to share Jesus with people in the marketplace, in theaters, and wherever they go. People on the street, I mean, I remember they were saying they picked up hitchhikers and shared Jesus Christ with them. And I was, uh, so as I stood back and looked at them, I said, well, these, these people are, are wild. They don't care. They just, you know, they're just sharing whatever they, whatever happened to them. So I call them the Wild Bunch. I, I want to go to that church and see what's going on. So I, I accepted Christ at that church and uh, was part of that Wild Bunch. And before you knew it, we had a group uh, there at the Lutheran Church and, and you know, and, 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 uh, and God began to work. The church was called the King of Glory, it was a Lutheran church and uh, uh, I always thought Lutheran churches were like that. So I asked one of the people who had been there quite a while, I said, if I knew this was a Lutheran church that had been, was like this, I would have came here a long time ago. And he says, you're absolutely wrong. This is not a regular Lutheran church. Something's happened here. So I, I perceived that God was working in that church in a great and mighty way, changing things dramatically. We had been there a few years, and uh, one of the believers of this wild bunch had this vision about starting a church down in Northtown to reach out as an outreach. So we we uh, asked uh, the leaders of the church we were going to, the Lutheran Church, came glory, and they get, we left there with their blessings without knowing exactly what we were going to do. 
So they found a place and that place, we opened the, the doors, we cleaned it out and we had to do a lot to it and it was just a place we read it. But in time the people started coming. We met on Friday nights at 7 p.m. and uh, Pastor Ray and his brother Johnny Gonzalez would conduct the meetings. Pastor Ray would sit in the back. That's the way it was for him back then. But anyway, there would be like guest speakers that they would hear on the Christian radio. They would invite them. And, and we had a lot of uh, guest speakers there. I mean, there were really evangelists, uh, just ministers. And one thing a lot of them said when we were there, because the building that we have, that is shown right here, it's an old storefront. It used to be a grocery store, and there was a little gas station right next to it outside. And um, we only had half the building. So there was a wall there, it was built, a wall, and a lot of the ministers would say, one of these days, you're going to knock that wall down, like to expand. And that day came, one, one day, that we were able to expand it, because it was growing, more families were coming to the service there, you know, on Friday nights. That was the outreach, but it turned out to be more than an outreach. And one day my husband said, I believe we need to start Sunday service. And I said, no, I don't think so. You know how I saw we want to kind of kick back and not get too overcommitted. And he said, yeah, we're going to do that. He says, but I won't be able to do it unless I leave my job. And then I said, well, I think you need to give me a little bit more time. But he said, I can't wait for you because you might never be ready. <laughs> he says, so God called me to do it, so we're going to we're going to trust that God's going to take care of you. And so we did. We approached the city about starting a church. And the city wouldn't let us have this uh, church because we didn't have a parking lot. Because the back of the building was, was actually the property line. And uh, so we asked the individual who owned the, the lot you know, next door if we could purchase that, and he said he was not too happy about us asking him about purchasing the lot. So that was kind of like we thought was the end of our uh, endeavor to start the church. But what happened is that uh, I believe the Lord touched him. He was afflicted. He was afflicted, and then he asked one of the leaders to go go pray for him. So at that time, uh, when he, they prayed for him, he, he said he wanted to sell the lot to the church. So we bought the lot and we were able to uh, make a parking lot there. The individual who owned the place was name was uh, his last name was Martinez. So I approached him about purchasing the, the building and uh, and he said that the, the price I gave him he said it was too much. So he reduced the price quite a bit. <laughs> of course, we accepted. They prayed over us that Sunday service, that was the last service, and they prayed over us and the elders as we were leaving to start our Sunday service the following Sunday. And this is actually the first service in October of 1978. There was somebody there with that had a, had a camera, so this is after the service they're coming out. And that's the original sign, the first sign. And I'm not sure who made that, if it was Pastor Ray or his brother, I'm not really sure. Before we knew it, we were establishing these things through the Spirit of God because in ourselves, we didn't know how to do none of these things. We were, we were just people wanting people to know that there was a better way than what they had. And that was the excitement you saw. And before we knew it, people were coming. People were coming with their families. People would visit. And then before we knew it, we were just seeing the ministry growing and we were excited and, and then you'd have the obstacles that you always want to come to, you know, to knock down or to destroy or to confute or whatever. But the foundation of Christ was so real to my husband and then before he knew it he had, you know, the leaders. He had those who were willing to become deacons and then elders. And I think it had, the church had started about a couple of months before we started going. We started coming to the church in 1978. That day that we went there, we um, we saw the heart of uh, Pastor uh, Ray and Pastor Manuel. They weren't ordained yet. They were ordained a month or two after that. But uh, we saw the heart of uh, 
pastors in them, and that really drew us to, to the church. Yes. He finally got ordained. He did get ordained within, within I think, within uh, eight to ten years. We went to a little, a little church. It was a big, old church in Los Angeles. And we were able to go there, and these people were people that were licensed. And they are the ones that said, we don't just ordain anyone that wants to be ordained. So they came and they were with us a few times. They would come to the church, they would kind of evaluate what was going on, and it was their choice if they did or not, you know, because they said, we are, we've gone to at least 100 churches that are starting people. I, I tell you, people were starting churches. It was just a movement. And he said, we can tell you that we only have like maybe a handful that we're going to ordain. And you guys are one of the churches we're going to ordain, which was Pastor Manny and my husband. And he goes, we really see a work here. So we're going to do it. So we went. Then the Lord called Pastor Ray and Pastor Manny to be a, a pastor. So mm -hmm. then after the, we went clear to Los Angeles and they were uh, ordained. ordained there in Los Angeles. And a lot of people went, and we had a very beautiful day that day. We went there to that little, to the big church, and they just prayed over them. We had a little service, and they just prayed over them, and then they signed there saying that they were ordained ministers. No big thing, no big, you know, it was just, but I think what we see in all this is that there was such a desire to serve the Lord that God just took care of everything else. He made everything else happen because he saw that they were willing vessels and that made it so beautiful. I remember the building um, when we first showed up. Um, I understand it was a store of some sort. And so they had divided the building in half. So uh, the half was the part that the church used, well, Pastor Ray has a uh, uh, outreach. And then there was a wall that separated the building. And on the other side of the wall was uh, little apartment units. It, it used to be um, a gas station. So they had um, uh, pumps that they removed. But on the back side of the church was um, a big wooden, almost like shed. It was the car repair uh, facility for, for the gas station. So that was all there when we showed up and after church, we would step outside of the building in the back and step into the garage repair area. That was nothing but gravel and that's where we would fellowship. Because when we got there, the church had already been established for two years when we got there. It's just, it didn't look like a church to me. And, but then, you know, once the word of God came, cause it was powerful. So he says, this is our home church the first day. I remember the first Sunday, because we come out of religion from these big churches, stained windows. And my wife and I, we really didn't have a lot of revelation of Christ. But anyway, I remember driving to the building and my wife says, this is not a church. <laughs> she says, it looks like an old store, which it did. But we were used to the, the religion, churches, buildings, and all that. But anyway, when we walked in, the building outside perhaps didn't look like a church. But when we walked inside, it was like the oasis. I, I felt uh, like God telling me, welcome, welcome, my son. And I remember that real clearly. I remember Brother Marcy embracing me. He didn't know me, I never met the man. But the love of the people was so awesome that I knew right there and then that that's where my home is gonna be. And I've been there since the day the Lord saved me in 82. In November, we entered the church for the first time. It was a little store that was not kept and it was torn down. and. To go to the classes, we had to go through a shower where the bathroom was at, and, and you pray that the, it wouldn't, you know, the Lord take care of this, these kids because, you know, it was just a place that needed a lot of fixing. I was about nine or ten, and my dad worked with uh, Brother Richard Delcy, 
And so he, Richard Delcy, invited us to go to the Rock Church. When we first went to the church in the beginning, it was not in the best part of town. And so <laughs> when we went, uh, we, we felt a little uncomfortable there for a while until it became home and uh, it's where we belonged. When we first started going, the, the bathroom was an outhouse in the back, and the parking lot was all dirt. Yeah. And all that was, um, we built, a, like I said, bathrooms. Everybody pulled together, all the men pulled together, built to build that. Mm -hmm. um, Brother Widow had a big part in that. He was always uh, leading the men to, to do the work, El Arviso. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then the women would come in at noon, and we'd have a feast out there. We would have all kinds of that was food, a good part. and you know, we, just, we were just working together. Everybody would help each other, and it was good. Before we knew it, that little corner place was just so beautiful. It was a beautiful little place, and even the the policemen, you know, they said this is like a transformation in this corner. We, you know, we take our hats off to this, you know, and we saw that and. There was many, many times where we just realized how good the Lord was. The person that invited me to the church for the first time was Brother Gene Martinez. He invited me to a men's fellowship at the Sizzler uh, over on Marigold and Sierra. And it was a very exciting time because as we were there worshiping God, we had the back banquet room uh, the musicians had their backs to the window and they were playing guitars and as they're playing guitars the back of the guitar necks I guess are black so somebody called Fontana Police Department and said there was a hostage situation because all the men were in tears with their hands in the air and their eyes closed and somebody thought that we were being held up so they called it in and we're worshiping God and I just remember seeing a flash of white light and I'm thinking what was that <laughs> <laughs> and we could hear the helicopter above the building and all of a sudden we were looking around and there was SWAT officers that had surrounded the building one of them came in and they called and they asked the manager if we were being held up and uh, the manager said no there's just a church group just serving God worshiping God in the back room so they came in to check it out and they were extremely mad they, they looked like they were bothered because they came in and, and it wasn't the scenario but as I walked out there was officers hiding behind pillars with weapons that were like ready to go into the building. So that was my first experience with the church and I said, this is an exciting place. I need to be here and serve God with these with these men. I wasn't saved yet and I know that we were searching. Mike had been saved already, but um, I kept telling him, find us a church and we'll go. And when he went to that service, at Sizzler and he came home and he said he found an exciting church. I said, I want to see what this church is about. But um, we came. Um, I came with an open heart. It was just like real welcoming. It was very welcoming. Um, you felt the love immediately. As soon as we became Christians, as soon as we started wanting to do ministry, and we have people coming from every side wanting us to go their way. And, well, let me teach you, let us teach you. You know, we've been Christians for a long time, you know, oh, you know. So, Ray would like, you know, we were getting people calling us and people coming and let us help you start the church. And Ray kept thinking, I, I don't know, Chata. I just think like, there's so many things that are just so, he said, but God, he's, he's like a rock, you know? He's like a rock, you know, he's not gonna be moved. And, and I don't believe he wants us to go. He goes, he's, he's a sure foundation. He says, that rock won't be moved. He won't, he won't allow that, no matter what's going to come. He says, because people are already trying to, to take us this way and that way. He says, and all of a sudden they're there. He goes, but I believe that, that rock is so stern, so firm, that we don't have to worry what's going to come. And he said, isn't that a good name? Wouldn't that be a good name? This is the way I remember more. Maybe him talking. Maybe there was others that had other ways that it came about. But I remember he'd always say, I think that would even be a good name. I said, yeah, but they even think we're like a rock group, you know, rock and roll, you know, rock and roll. And he, I, he goes, only you would say that, Chata. Only you would say that, a rock and roll. 
said, well, okay, he filled the rock. Jesus is a rock, Jatha. I go, okay. I said, well, it's not up to us. He goes, well, we'll see. But I think more or less between the leaders and them, they kind of said that's a good, you know, good way of, but you know, wives, you know, we, we always have to say things that are, he said, no, I said, Ray, you're going to see. There's going to be people, they're going to think that we're a rock group. They're going to think, and there was. Oh, you guys, you know, no, you know, we're a church. Oh, we thought it was like a, you know, we could come and rock out. No, you can't, not, you can rock out with the Lord. But. So that's about the size of that. And other people said amen. Pastor Ray and myself, uh, we traveled to many places together, ministered together, North Dakota, New York, Arkansas, Mexico, and we, uh, we had four trips to India together, myself and Ray, working together and, uh, you know, just ministering the gospel together. There were several other churches that we gathered together. Uh, one was in Arkansas, one was in North Dakota, one was in New York. We went to, I believe the first convention in New York was in 1985. So that was the first one. And then we would alternate between Arkansas, North Dakota, and California. And it was really good because we had fellowship with other churches from other areas, believers, and very encouraging to hear the teachings, the uplifting, the fellowship that we had there. And that was um, a time, it was an open door there for a number of years that we were able to do that. I believe up until the 90s, late 90s. At the conventions, uh, we think that uh, that exposed us to different brethren, that people you know, all across the country, they love God the way we do. And we formed uh, new friendships, and uh, I, I uh, think that as a church, well, me personally, I was really blessed by being able to uh, meet uh, some of these other brothers in, in these different states. We did it uh, five days a week, uh, from like nine o'clock in the morning till probably uh, five o'clock in the evening, and uh, take time off in the middle of the day for lunch a few hours rest and then uh, come back and, and continue. So I think those are very beneficial to us as the church and again just being able to meet other brothers and sisters and just the friendships that we formed. We um, had a church <laughs> conventions and uh, we went to uh, Arkansas <clears throat> and one of the conventions many years back and uh, you know we always had a good time and one of the funniest things that happened was um, some of the ladies from our church decided to go do some uh, laundry in downtown Arkansas. Uh, the city there was a... Um, it was a very small city. Desert. Desert, uh, Arkansas. Arkansas. So they took their clothing in bags and they went into the... They saw the washers and dryers. Yeah, they had driven by. They had driven by and they had seen all these washers. So, you know, there's a laundromat, let's go do our wash. Yes. So they got all their wash together and they went in and they started loading their clothes in the washing machine. And this man just came up to started coming up to me. What are you ladies Can I doing? help you, ladies? <laughs> she goes, "Where do you put the money in?" And he goes, uh, "Excuse me, lady, this is an appliance store." It wasn't a laundry. It was not a laundromat. It was an appliance store, and they were so. so they took all their clothes back and, and walked away. But the next day, in the news, in their their, it was local, in their news, local newspaper, ladies trying to do laundry in an appliance store. It was a funny, I mean, it was funny. to this day, we haven't we forgotten We still that. remember. We used to use the Chafee High School for conventions, and I would, uh, being an employee there, they would allow me to rent the building, and uh, we would use the cafeteria, and they would allow me to be the one to open it and close it so we didn't have to have staff on site. So that was my initial uh, involvement in the church. We met a lot of people through conventions, we used to have conventions in the church <laughs> that really helped our walk because we, we met people from other parts of the world, like from India, the Barnabas family. And we realized that the gospel was not just for us, it was for all the world. We, we did go to different parts of, of the United States. We got to meet other other saints and um, even from Mexico and in 83 there used to be a, a brother his name was Luis Martinez he was on fire for the Lord and 
he got saved, he was coming to the rock. We used to have a, a Spanish church and the English church in the same building. The Spanish church would meet in the rear built uh, 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 room of, of our main sanctuary. And this brother Luis Martinez, he, he, he expressed his concern about his family in Tijuana. And so that entered uh, a time for us to go visit Tijuana. And I remember hearing about it, and right away that, that desire entered my heart that I wanted to be a part of this work, to go and see Tijuana, to go meet the family of our brother Luis Martinez. We went to Tijuana. I remember it was Pastor Ray, Brother Manuel Torres, Brother Jim Gates, Brother Daniel, and myself. We went, and another brother, uh, Chris, and uh, we went to Tijuana, and I remember coming to his aunt's house, and when she saw Luis Martinez, she started to cry, because she was so excited that Luis Martinez was a different man. He, he was not the same person. And right away, she opened, embraced us and opened her heart, not only to us, but to the Lord. And that morning, she got saved. But, and then along the way, we met uh, Pastor Mario. And uh, we, we took a like in him, and Pastor Ray took a like in him to him. And so he invited us one day to go and minister over there, in Tijuana by El Rio. So we went, and uh, we've been there, going there for probably about 15 years now. For me, it's important. Uh, to, because we can reach out to the lost people. Like, like, you, mean, like, like you know, when we went, we went to Tijuana, it's, we've been blessed every time that I go, because um, we, like the Bible says, you know, we have to, you know, preach the Word of God everywhere that we go. And uh, since I've been going, you know, I've been blessed. It's important for us to reach out, because we need, you know, I, Every person out there who doesn't know God's lost. I mean, we're all God's kids. We just need to bring each other to God. We served together at the Rock for 15 years, together with with Pastor Ray, uh, and the love and support of the Rock Ministry. God raised up Iglesia La Roca. There was uh, about three people there that didn't understand any English. So I, I had a burden and I asked Pastor Ray, can, can I start ministering to the Spanish-speaking people? And he said, yeah. So kind of like a Sunday school, I began with three before you knew it. I had about 30 people. It just began to grow and grow. And then uh, because of, uh, you know, the room, we had to uh, launch out and get another place because there wasn't enough room for the two. So with an agreement with Ray and, uh, and uh, we found a, a building on the same street, and, and we began uh, to minister there, you know, and uh, with a with a prayer and support of the Rock, they they were. It's not something we did on our own, but uh, through prayer, they they backed us up. They said yes, so so we started that, and and we started th that outreach as we had started the Rock outreach. We started ministry to the Spanish-speaking community. We see in the Word of God how Paul and and Barnabas, how they served God together, how they were used mightily. But it's a judgment call on the circumstance that happened, whether you believe Paul was right, Barnabas was right. In my opinion, I don't think either one was, the, the, them being right wasn't the case. I truly believe it was God desiring to use them both in different areas. So he had to bring that separation in some manner. And I really feel like that was a similar situation with La Roca. Because think about it how many more people were reached with the gospel through two works as opposed to one work. Because if it wasn't of God, neither one of us would still be here. But both ministries are going strong. And God is in the center of both. We had teachers, we had some people that have gone to be with the Lord. Uh, we had Pat Martinez and Eugene Martinez as teachers and Sister Margaret um, Serna at the time, um, to, and, and her husband Gilbert, and they went to be with the Lord, they were our teachers, and 
we had Pastor Ray and Sister Anita and um, other brethren that would come and speak to us. And during that time, um, I was 17 years old. Growing up there was um, a blessing in the church, growing up as a teenager. Kathy and I actually grew up in this church um, most of our lives. And when we were younger, we met and fell in love and we got married while we were here at this church in, in the 90s, early 90s. And we both felt called to be, have some involvement in missions. And so a few months after we got married, we left for a while to work with, with the mission. And while we were there, we thought we were going to stay there, but while we were there, we kept talking. And we felt like God wanted us to come back and um, see if there would be an open door to kind of start an official youth ministry, youth group kind of um, service here at the church. So when we came back in 94, we asked Pastor Ray and we talked about it with him and he felt the same way. And so in Rock Church in Cucamonga is where we started working with the youth there. Kathy had already been working with the youth actually by herself as well as church leaders and elders who were already doing the work, but we kind of wanted it to be more like a, a traditional youth group, youth ministry, so. We weren't actually um, trying to be a youth leader in any way, but us being the older, the older ones in youth, we were um, just given more responsibility, and through that responsibility, we became youth leaders. It's almost like a, um, like a, tag team, you know, like you know, we're, we always go with uh, what we just and Kathy with um, to some of the youth outings and, and just being a part of it. It's just, it's just feels that we've kind of uh, grown together in uh, the youth ministry and and some of our visions have kind of blended. I think a favorite theme of working with the youth ministry is being able to be a small part of their lives, the young people again. To just be able to pray with them and show them what God has shown us over the years of growing up in a Christian home and, and trying to impart that to them and then just praying for them as they go through their lives and you know, just let God be their own guide. I like the games. <laughs> <laughs> Here at the Rock in Fontana, on a Friday night, we had hundreds of balloons in the foyer downstairs. It was a big old game. And then uh, on another occasion, we played a tortilla tag with uh, corn tortillas. So there was hundreds of tortillas all the way, everywhere downstairs. And I don't know how many bags of vacuum uh, we, we filled up. Um, but it's not about the games. It's about being with, with the youth and just enjoying their energy and their um, the hope that God has for them in their lives and what he wants to do with them. The Lord can use somebody as young in their youth and we learn that with the youth group too. It doesn't matter what age you are, God is going to use you if you're willing. My youth leaders have been a blessing in my life because going through middle school, high school, I've always it's harder when you have a. It's easier when you have teachers like Brother Regis, Scrappy, but the hobby sister Amanda, that will coach you, help you get through school. They've always been there for me, and um, I'm really thankful for them. The Mission Nets Ministry started. Oh, gee, oh, I I couldn't even tell you the year it started, but it started. Um, in fact. Um, Melissa was very young when it started. Primos. Daisies and Prims first because they were everyone was so little at that time. But with those two classes, it started growing, and then we started getting the other classes. And the last class we got was um, Friends, which um, I took that one right away because the girls were older. We taught them how to sew. We taught them how to knit. There was many things that we did with them. All the adventures we had and camping and, you know, we'd even camp in our backyard and do things with them and have camp outs at the home. And so we really enjoyed having, I enjoyed being in the missionettes. Just to be used, you know, to encourage the young girls and 
just to see you know them coming and having that hunger to learn the word of God and to take it out with them not just to hear it but to practice it wherever they are you know with their peers with their family and um, it encourages them and encourages me the derby race that was the other thing we had derby race and and that's when the Royal Rangers got involved you take a little block of wood and kind of shape it into whatever kind of car, whatever you, you, you can imagine and bring to life. And then we put them on a track and then we race them for, uh, for first place glory. And, you know, making the cars and, you know, doing ramps and having barbecues. I mean, we were never bored. The main thing behind the program was to reach, teach and keep kids for Christ. That was the whole thing behind it. It was a scouting program and it still is and it's still going strong up to this day. My commander, my senior commander, uh, was told that, that they wanted to start the program at the church. And that's when I was transferred over from my church over there to where I was originally. And I came to the rock and I grew from there. Its, it's goal is to uh, mentor and minister to young boys and uh, guide them into being leaders. So not just the mentoring in life, but to really mentor and teach them to be leaders um, in the church and then, and then out there in their home. It was easy to get into it because it was a boys ministry and we had two little boys. I just saw the need, not maybe only in, in my life and in my boy's life, but just in the community, just in boys in general, just the value of, uh, of being there for young people. I looked forward to the Royal Ranger events because I knew I was going to be with these guys and all, uh, all the friends in the church. I knew that we were going to spend a weekend together, so I always looked forward to that. And then when we were camping, there was just always something going on with us. And so it was like a cold night while we were camping, and my father, he got a rock, and he decided to put it like underneath the fire. And then we were, when we were ready to go to sleep, he took the rock out, and he put it in our tent to like keep his back warm or something. And then like like the middle of the night we smell like this plastic burning and he's like oh, oh 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 and then we look and there's like this huge hole in our tent from this rock that was on fire in our tent and like we, we broke our eureka <laughs> <laughs> to see more people coming and they wouldn't allow us to build there no more because they said we were in a residential area and they wasn't able to, there was no more parking area where we would be able to, so they said we, we won't approve that. So they said, well, we'll just stay here, but Pastor and them had more, they wanted more. It got to the point where people were standing outside the building, some of the church services. So I thought that, uh, and Pastor Ray commented on the fact that you know, we needed to think about that a little bit and pray about it. I had the thought about maybe looking for another church, another place we could expand the church. I believe also that um, the work was done in Rancho because when we moved there, just about every corner had a bar and there was a lot of violence. And throughout the years as we prayed and were there, um, all the bars disappeared. There wasn't really that much violence and the barrio did change and I believe it was because we were there and there was a lot of prayer going up for that area and God saw that there was a need somewhere else and uh, he took us over here, brought us here. Like I said, uh, we all grew it mm -hmm. and Brother Eddie uh, and others were looking at a place to to buy, to purchase, to, uh, to move to a new place. So one of the places we had in mind was uh, a place up by uh, on Center Street, above Foothill, and that didn't come through. Another place was down in Jersey, uh, off of Haven, and that didn't come through. See, the idea was to try to keep the church in Rancho Cucamonga. So another place I looked at was uh, on uh, Vineyard and uh, 9th Street, the corner there, and that didn't seem to be feasible at that time. Another place I looked at was uh, right behind the steering sign on Archibald, the big lot there, but that was half a million dollars without even any kind of construction or everything we had to go through. So that was going to be very, very expensive. So everybody was uh, uh, set on staying in Rancho Cucamonga.
initially in the move process, there was a lot of reservations. But Pastor had that call upon his heart that I believe was given to him by God through the Holy Spirit, that even the scripture came to cast your net to the other side. But we know that that prompting came and that scripture came for a reason because he desired to use us even where we're at now. And I saw this ad and I called this realtor up. It was Linda Clinton. So I went up to her and met her in Fontana, which is where we're at right now. And I saw the place, it had a chain link fence, a rock gravel road. It was uh, being used as a party place for weddings and things of that sort. And uh, I went down and I talked to Pastor, a few of the, the bread in there, and I said, why don't we come up and take a look at it? And I kind of sensed nobody was really interested in coming to Fontana. <laughs> I had that sense. You know, moving to Fontana, everybody's heart was set on Rancho. So I said, you know, we have to see, we have to see something here. We sold the building, or we, yeah, we, we sold the building, and we have, really have a place until at that time, that transition time. But. Prior to coming here, we went to Chafee High School for over 11 months. We had to be there because of the conditional use permit for this building. We didn't get the clearance for it, so we weren't able to use this building as a church. So for 11 months, we rented uh, a auditorium at Chafee High School. And as we did that, again, there was a shaking. Pastor called it a shaking of the branches. And he said, the loose fruit are going to fall off. Those who are not attached strongly to the branch are going to fall off. He said, that's OK. We're doing what God's calling us to do. And as we went there, we saw the body decrease somewhat. But then we saw it build back up. And that's how we came to the one here in, uh, off of Foothill and, and Cherry. We're right here, not very close. And there was a lot of work that was done here to yes. um, modify it, to renovate it, and, uh, and do the parking lot in the back. And what you see now wasn't like this when we first purchased it. It was a, an old, um, where they had um, parties and receptions. And uh, so we had to clean out a lot of things. And, uh, and the Holy Spirit, uh, the Lord, uh, really guided us in uh, doing what needed to be done. And uh, so we have the church here, and that's how we, uh, we uh, grew. It was in 1994 when I did the first play, uh, the first little Easter play that we did at the Old Rock Church. And so uh, from there on, um, you know, I saw people being touched. And like, for example, Sister Sheila's mom was touched in one of the plays as well. I'm not sure exactly which one, but um, I knew that even if we worked very hard for the past three, four months, that one day that we had to do our, our show or our play, our presentation, uh, it was cool because afterwards I would find out that people were saved through that. So it was nice. It was a different type of ministry, but it was really, uh, really exciting. I think what stands out the most was um, when I was working with the children of all ages, of obviously. Um, it's the dancing part because the kids wanted to, die, you know, they're dying to get into the, the the dancing part where whenever we had something going on, uh, they all wanted to be first. They all wanted to be the the leader. Uh, but it was really cool because um, I think this really excited the children and motivated the children, like a lot of them that are adults now, you know. The, the, the places where we performed most of the plays uh, was at the high school Chafee Auditorium. Uh, we st I started with the church, the Rock Church in, in Cucamonga, uh, but as you know, there was a little church and we really couldn't put too much going on in the front of the altar area. So we started um, renting the hall and um, so I could tell you that the majority of all the plays were there. And we had a good crowd because it was, uh, it was uh, you know, uh, you know, it's something different and people really look forward to it every year, either Easter or it was Christmas, so we, we did both. I know I've been the Lord just made a way uh, to use our home for baptisms. We've had baptisms there, 
We've had weddings there, people who had given their yes. lives to the Lord and wanted to make things right and ended up, you know, getting married at our, at our, at our home. And we've had a lot of gatherings, um, but a, a lot of baptisms, a lot of baptisms yeah. there. Well, we purchased a home that where we live now. Uh, we said, that, oh, Lord, however you want to use this home. Yes. And uh, we just uh, put it in the Lord's hands, said, Lord, you gave us this, we'd give it back to you. Yes. And you use it as you want to use it. Uh, so we've had a, a blessed time. Uh, we've been blessed having yes. people there and I look forward to uh, having uh, uh, future gatherings as we've had in the past. So really you know their testimonies there's some that have beautiful testimonies and you know just getting to know to S sister Lupe and sh she's fabulous I mean she you know I love her worship oh my goodness it's beautiful it's been amazing to get to know the other sisters what they're going through and just how the Lord has used them and how God has blessed them and and really healed and done amazing things and that's awesome to see and hear. To me it helps me because I realized that maybe throughout the year I went through different experiences and I run into someone who is like, wow, they they went through similar, almost the same and it encourages me because I say I'm not alone, you know, there's other sisters that went through it or are going through it and we're together as sisters and family and it feels good, you know, to know that I have someone that I can talk to or look to and say, hey, remember last year we talked about this? How are you, you know? And that feels really good to me. I think that because we can all, you know, learn from each other and the awesome thing is that we can all gather together and worship the Lord. And I believe that one day we all, all churches are going to be in heaven and worship the Lord as one. And it's a blessing just to know that that we have other churches uh, get together and worship the Lord, spirit and truth. I, I, I see brothers, what uh, the Lord has done in their lives, in their family lives, how the Lord, you know, um, changed my life. And we kind of connect each other. And it's, it's, it's been a blessing for me just gathering with the other brothers. We stir one another's faith up. Uh, we're able to give courage one to another. Uh, we're able to discover things in the Word that maybe we saw them, but didn't see fully certain things that somebody else from a, you know, from another church is able to help us see. And so it's been a great blessing for us. And it's helped us to grow uh, spiritually as a church. And uh, brothers and sisters here, we always look forward to the retreat. That's a highlight of our, of our year. And so it's a blessing for us. At the time that uh, this happened with Pastor Ray's decision to raise somebody up was uh, approximately two and a half years before the transition, transition actually took place. We had a leaders meeting here at the church, it was a Tuesday night. And one of the things that Pastor Ray brought up was that he had been thinking about this for some time. And he felt in his heart that he wanted to raise up one of the leaders and begin to slowly train them, give them teaching opportunity on a Sunday morning, just to, just to begin to develop uh, the person that he felt would be the person to uh, step in and, and uh, assume the responsibilities of pastor. So we're all sitting there and we're thinking, wow, where did this come from? Because really it was something that had never been mentioned. So literally he took us all by surprise. So then Pastor Ray said, in, in giving this thought, I feel that the person that I would want to ask this of would be Brother Mike. And that was a desire of, of, of pastor, but it was always a desire in my heart to, to go forward and to serve God. It was something that God placed in my heart uh, from the early days of my salvation. I knew that God had called me, and I just didn't know in what way. 
And on a daily basis, I would hear that pull in my heart and I would hear that cry of God that he was wanting to use me and I just didn't know how. And I knew it was in a role of pastor, which is, sounds really ridiculous even to my own ears to say, because it seemed like something that was impossible. But God continued to provoke my heart that way. And then I came into being an elder and I looked around and I said, every single one of these men have been here longer than I have, have been serving God longer than I have, are more qualified to lead in a position of pastor. And at, at that time my thought was, because there was talk about uh, branching out and beginning another work. So I thought, okay, well, God, is that how you're going to do it? And maybe you're going to send me out. And I thought, well, God's going to probably send one of these men out because I, I know that I see them in a very high esteem. And, but I knew that God was putting these things in my heart for a reason. So that's, that was when I began to, to go to Bible college and just try to get prepared to be the best leader I could be. And whatever God had, I would just go forward in it. And he shared his reasons why he said, you know, Pastor, uh, Brother Mike is, is a good brother. He's been with us a good number of years. He's solid. He's faithful. He has uh, the ability to teach. Pastor Ray was able to foresee the need for the church in, in, uh, in uh, appointing Pastor Mike at that time years back uh, to be a pastor in the future, not knowing that, uh, that uh, the situation would come up that uh, Pastor Mike stepped in. In all honesty, the last thing I would imagine was to be sitting in this position now. Pastor was not, not just my pastor, he was my friend. And the example that he was to me was overwhelming. It, it played a huge role in my life. It guided me in more ways than just the Word of God that he shared, the way he lived his life, the humbleness that he had, the way he treated people the love that he constantly showed, those were things that he poured into me, whether he did it with words or just his actions. And that was something that changed my heart forever. I remember the Sunday morning that I came to church <clears throat> and um, pastor was uh, out in the lobby. I came in, I said hi. and. As, as I do on most Sunday mornings, <clears throat> I went upstairs to uh, set up the computer <clears throat> and get other things uh, ready for uh, that Sunday morning service. And so <clears throat> now it's 9.10, and now it's like, hmm, pastor is usually up here by now. He's walking up and down the aisles, he's greeting people, and it's, I wonder what's, what's going on. So now it's 9.15, now it's 9.20, and then it's like, okay, some, something's not right. Uh, it's not like pastor to not be up here already by this hour. And that morning, you could see that he was, he was hurting. There was definitely something wrong. And as we could see that he was having problems, even um, getting to his feet, even being able to, to stand up straight, um, I can remember we have my arm around him and looking in his eyes and knowing that he needed to he needed to go home. We had seen in our leaders meeting just prior to that some of the other leaders made mention that pastor seemed like he was becoming overwhelmed and we know he had gone through so much. He had just had a hernia surgery. Three days later, he was doing a, a funeral service for uh, his family member, for his sister. And uh, just the loss alone is hard enough to deal with, let alone all of the, the pain of the surgery and such that he had gone through. But it was definitely more than that. But as I looked into his face that morning, I knew that my flesh said, what are we going to do? And I stood there with a few of the other leaders and uh, we said, call, call Sister Anita, she needs to take him home now. And I knew in my heart that I needed to go forward and share the word of God, that God had called me to do that. Pastor had already put me in a position 
of assistant pastor to go forward and I couldn't look around to see who else is going to do this even though my flesh wanted to be fearful to be nervous to say I I'm concerned about my pastor I want to take him home I want to be with him I want to see but I know that God said go forward go share the word of God and, and I went forward that day and that morning and, and shared the word of God and I, I knew that that was where God had called me to be so we really had no idea what was going on with him. And so we're, we're praying, Lord, whatever's going on, you know, you touch him, you heal him. We would go visit him, we would go pray for him. So the church was doing that, the leaders were doing that. And we believed in our heart that after a time, uh, Pastor Ray would get better as we would pray. So uh, unfortunately, uh, that was uh, not the case. And as we continued forward from that day, uh, we began to see things start to deteriorate and we didn't know anything about any sickness. The doctors kept telling him that he was tired, that he had other, other circumstances to his sickness, but you, you could tell that, that that wasn't the case. From that point forward, we sat down with the family and sat down with Pastor, a few of the elders, and got a better understanding of what was going on. Um, I can remember on a weekly basis giving reports on the progress and what was going on and the attempts of the doctors to try to make things right and to try to bring healing. Um, I remember we were all praying for a, a specific um, procedure and we were all crying out in that manner. And I remember a pastor saying no. And um, we as leaders were, were broken hearted and we went and spoke with him and, and Sister Anita and, and he shared that through his, his wife and, and even his own words as well that none of these things were gonna bring healing. The doctors had already told him that. His decision was to say, I'm no longer going to fight this. I'm just gonna go forward in what God has set before me. And we stood with him in that. That day gave us an understanding of where he was at and there was not one ounce of fear in our pastor's heart. He said it with a smile on his face, knowing where he's going. He said it with a confidence. He just said, no. And we. We even pleaded, we don't know, maybe something could change. And he said, no, he knew. And at that point, we had that peace of God, and, and we knew that that was the avenue that God was going to use. So in going forward in those things, knowing that God had a plan through this, we held on to the scripture, Romans 8, 28, of all things work together for good for those to those who love God and those who are the called according to his purpose and we know our pastor loved the Lord with all his heart and we know that he was called so we said God is doing his will and we have to be obedient because he's gonna guide us we know by his Holy Spirit he's gonna lead us in this ministry and that's when we went forward in that and I remember the the call in my heart to go through some of the books in the New Testament on Wednesday nights. And I can remember Pastor being in a wheelchair, unable to, to speak, but he could smile and you could understand what he was trying to get his point across. And I remember him sitting in the front row when we started 2 Timothy chapter 1. And 2 Timothy is a letter in regards to a father figure writing to his spiritual son, knowing that this was his time he was going home. And I kept crying out, Lord, how can I do this with my pastor sitting there in this circumstance? But God had planned the whole thing. And as we went through that portion that night, we didn't see our pastor for a little while after that. He wasn't able to be here with us any longer. And he made it back 
And when he made it back for it was the last chapter of 2 Timothy. The last writings of, of Paul before he was beheaded and, and taken home to be with the Lord. And to me it felt so fitting and appropriate that this man who had blessed us and given so much of his life to lead us in the ways of the Lord, to be an example to us. We, we, we saw it lived out in the Word of God and we saw it lived out before our eyes. A man that loved the Lord, that said, follow me as I follow Christ because he was that kind of example. A man that loved the people of God. And in that we just went forward. The more that Pastor Ray declined, the more we were concerned about what were we going to do as, as the church as leaders. And so then the leaders, the elders got together and that was discussed. So, so what are we going to do about Pastor Ray? He, he's not getting better and we thought, well, two and a half years ago, Pastor Ray said, I want to raise up somebody. And that somebody was, was uh, Brother Mike. And Brother Mike was given his opportunities to share. And I'm sure that uh, Pastor Ray mentored Brother Mike. So a decision was made that I think, I think as leaders we met on a Saturday morning after prayer. And we said, tomorrow, Sunday morning, we will announce to the church that we are going to raise up Brother Micah's pastor. It was on that, that following Sunday morning that uh, I stepped up to the pulpit to make the announcement about the leaders having gotten together and the decision that was made that Brother Mike was going to be raised up on the following Sunday, a week from the announcement. So I said, the leaders have been praying. This gives us a week for the church to pray, but, but know for a fact that a week from today, we are going to raise Brother Mike up as pastor. So the week went by. The following Sunday came, I shared with the church that everything that I was sharing with them had already been shared with the Gonzalez family so that they were fully aware of the leader's intent and that they understood that we were doing what was in Pastor Ray's heart to do when the time came that Pastor Ray felt that he would no longer be able to minister and to oversee the church as the pastor. I wanted the church to fully understand, and I think the way I conveyed that, on that morning, they understood the leader's heart and the leader's intention. So on the morning that pastor, Brother Mike was anointed, raised up as pastor, was a um, very difficult, moment for the church, I'm sure. All these things seem to be kind of a whirlwind to all of us as leaders, I believe. But God knew what he was doing. And all things are in his will. I, I know the church as a whole, misses him. We all wish that things are not as they are. But we all of us pray, Lord, your will be done. And that was his will. To take Pastor Ray home. I thank God for, for Pastor Ray. We parted the fear of God in our lives. We imparted holiness into our lives. We imparted the Word of God in our lives. He had the love of God in him, 
he glowed, he um, just very loving and I think that's what um, that's what a lot of us saw in him is the love of God and I'm, I'm thankful I'm thankful that we had him all these years and he's definitely missed. He was an inspiration to me. He never judged anybody and I'm grateful for that. I, I just thank for my pastor. I loved him and he was a good pastor. I miss him. I miss Pastor Ray, first of all, that's what I want to say. Uh, I miss him dearly uh, because I, I adopted Pastor Ray as my pastor. I knew that the Lord had brought us together. He came into my life when I really needed someone to mentor me. He was so open and so willing. And I'm so blessed to, to have known him. And uh, it was, it's a great blessing. Me and Ray had a good friend. And I miss Ray a lot of times. But, you know, I know ministry took us in different roads. I know there was some times, there was some, it wasn't a perfect thing. There was disagreements as to how we should do ministry, but, but we always worked it out. We always would sit down and talk. We never, we never had any animosity or bitterness towards one another. But I, you know, I'm so thankful I, for Pastor Ray. Through his life, I learned a lot of a lot of good things, you know, he taught me a lot. I'm grateful for the years that we worked together. And, and I know the race with, uh, in the presence of the Lord now. And, um, the Lord did it his way. And the way it was done, it was beautiful because Pastor Ray was full of the spirit and knew exactly what to do. And um, Pastor Mike is here because of the, the prayers and the, the hearts, the Holy Spirit working in, in the hearts that leaders and elders and pastor. I truly want to say thank you to the Gonzalez family, to our sister Anita who stands with us today, who continues to serve God with all her heart, but to Joanne, to Mark, to Aaron, to the grandchildren, all those who allowed us to share so much of Pastor Ray's life because he gave so much of himself to the body that we know it took away from you guys as a family. And we appreciate you guys greatly and we thank you so much for that because it blessed so many. He was used to move so many lives closer to God, to open so many hearts to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Whether they continue here serving God with us or they're serving God somewhere else, the foundation came through the word of God that was shared by Pastor Ray. And, and you could never even count the amount of lives that were moved and changed. So I say that to you as a family, thank you. Thank you for sharing your father with us, your husband with us, because he became that spiritual father to us as well. I don't believe his word has ever changed, so we're safe. We're, we're secure because we have still the living word and that is what's gonna keep us. It's, that's what's gonna keep us going and that foundation that pastor put there with the Spirit of God, you see it in, in, the, in the leaders today. They're, they're there, they're, they're strong leaders. They're not, they're not wavering, they're strong. And like Pastor, Pastor Mike, you know, he, he knows. He saw that foundation being built. He was with us all those years for almost 24 years, if I'm not mistaken, maybe even more, I'm not sure. But he's building on that, but he has his own foundation and he's coming with the word of God. Yes, the way Ray, he saw those things, but he has his own way of ministering the word of God but they have that foundation and they want to continue. And I think that's so beautiful, is that we're not left. We're not left at no. all. We have, you know, we want to be those that are given the good report. And when we give the good report, it encourages us to continue. So that's my vision, that I want to be there because I know pastor would say, you stay there, Chapa. You stay there. 
and you know God's going to finish it. He's going to finish it because it's His work, it's not ours, and we're just a vessel that's going to be used. God didn't bring us to this point. God didn't bring this body 40 years to stand and look back at all the good things He's done. God has brought us to this point to rejoice in those things, but to look forward in all He has for us to do now. Because there's no finish line here. The finish line is when we get home, when He calls us home. So as we continue to gather, as we continue to go forward, God has a call for this body. 40 years sounds like a long time, and it is. But God has only begun the work that He's going to do here. But He has called us in the same manner to pour in to this work. To say, here I am, Lord, send me. Just be involved in what your church is doing. Uh, whether it is, if it is simple, or is, is, it is a small uh, thing, just be a part of it and enjoy it. Enjoy the fellowship of the other kids that are doing it. and. Um, and you just grow. Uh, Pastor Ray left his mark that will never ever be forgotten and uh, we're sitting uh, continue to grow as a church. We've got a new sign out in front and uh, I see it as not only, I, I see it as like really and as, as we were praying this morning um, I see the new light out front like like new oil it's gonna be brighter um, and it's it's a beacon so I see um, just even that physical sign out in the front being a tool um, just to be a light. The ability to be able to be involved, like whether you're 10 years old or 40, like however old you are, there's something for you to do in the church. And so um, I just know that I've had great experiences at the church and being able to be used in different ministries, even being super young. If Jesus is here, what are we looking for? He's here with us, and he's, he loves us, and we love him. It has been a blessing to grow up around so many Christians because, like, if you have any questions or anything about a certain topic, you can just go and ask anybody in the church, and they'll, they'll be willing to help you. I feel that everybody should get involved somehow. Um, it's something that I guess we're called to do. We're all supposed to reach out and be a part. So I think everybody should be a part in some way or another. Something about the church that has not changed. The Word of God, to me, that hasn't changed it's still for 24 years. It's the same salvation from Pastor Ray to Pastor Mike, still. All the elders and deacons, still the same. Still going strong. Who do you learn about at church? Jesus. Good, Jesus. Uh, do you like the cookies? Yeah. And the donuts? Yeah. <laughs> I believe it's important for people to step out and get involved in ministry because you're pouring something back into and not just taking. Um, and in doing so, the Word of God is flowing through you and not just becoming stagnant within you. And it allows you to be refreshed as well as refreshing others. I like coming to church because it's fun. I like coming to church because we are all family and we all get to see each other. I like coming to church because of the worship and the loud music <laughs> and the teachers. <laughs> One thing that I think we've both gotten from even being a part of this 40th celebration and being able to record these videos for the documentary, it's, it's just been so awesome to hear the story of how the church began and we've been here our whole lives and we kind of just it's always been there it's nothing that we've really thought about like I wonder how it all started but like to see how God's hand was upon every single aspect of the church's beginning even up until now his hand has still been upon everything and it's just amazing to see and it's a privilege to be a part of this it's a privilege to to be the next generation that God wants to use in this work that he started 40 years ago and just to see the people that poured their lives into this work and now we get a chance to just help out in any little way that we can and it's just been a blessing. I'm really happy that I was able to come here and like I tell my husband, I wish that we would have came earlier 
you know, that we would have uh, came here when we first met Bob. But like he tells me, he goes, Mary, it wasn't meant. Our time for us to come was when we did come. And we're very thankful. It's been a blessing to me, a blessing to my wife. And we're blessed and uh, we just give uh, the Lord all the glory. Yes, keep, um, keep doing things to uh, reach out for the people. I I like church because I learn about Jesus. I like church because we learn about singing songs. It's it's my grandma tells me who who tells me Jesus loves me, and I go and yell the Bible. Well, there's no other way but to stay in the Lord. I give you. I have the same for everybody that sees this because. Jesus is the way, he's the only one that can take care of us, keep us. We go out there and, and we share the gospel and we care for them because Jesus uh, portrayed that. And my favorite thing about the church is that it's small and everybody knows each other. Everything about the church is the music because I really like the music here. One thing I like about coming to church on Sunday's morning is giving Brother Al a visit in his class. Growth you know, in our lives spiritually. Grow in the love of Jesus. My favorite thing about the church is the class because you get to learn about God more. We get to do some crafts and we get to learn about God. We have to show our love. It, it, it yeah. makes a difference. It was, it's been a blessing all these years. Uh, we're not perfect, but we're, we're trying to, to do God's will, you know, in many ways. And, I say that the Rock Church is a, a good church. It's good if you want to know Jesus. Philippians 1 6 says that be confident of this very thing that he who started a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And we know that God wants us to serve him while he leaves us here on this planet until we see him, until he returns. My vision for, for the church is to draw near to God, to draw near to one another. The Bible says that iron sharpens iron. And that's why we need one another. And that's one of the things that has kept us through the years. Just continue to uphold the vision that Pastor Ray had. That is that we preach the Word of God simply, that we reach out to those that don't know him through uh, whatever means we have available, uh, just reach out, invite those around to come and join us. To continue the work that God began, it's not gonna die in one generation. It's gonna continue on. He has a purpose for the Rock Christian Church. And we're going to continue uh, in the direction he wants us to go. God's not asking who's qualified. I never think God ever asked that who's calling, who's qualified. But God's asking who's willing. One thing I think that was one of the greatest strengths of the Rock Church is from the very beginning, many who came, it was just common practice to say, what can I do? They came together and there was an excitement. And that excitement drew them to service and they came in a manner to say what can I do not what can I get how can I help not what do you offer everyone pulling together with that same heart God used mightily and we're here 40 years later because God used each and every one of those tools in a mighty way to continue his work in the midst of this body 40 years it's like it's like unbelievable because that's a lot of years. You don't hear ministries going on that long, and that's that's a long time. And it wasn't organized by uh, an organization; it was just people having a hunger and a thirst for for something that God made real. Look at what Jesus has done, and how He has given us that sure foundation, and for us to just encourage one another in that way. And as much as it's in our effort and in our strength to continue to encourage one another in the world. Happy and blessed anniversary to the Rock Church. 
and may God, you know, fulfill his plan and purpose and fulfill your ministry and that you continue to be a light in the community. It's a blessing to know that you are going on your 40th year. That's amazing because nowadays there's some churches that don't last very long. I believe that you are one in a million that has been able to reach this milestone and, and uh, you're a great testimony. And happy 40th happy anniversary. anniversary. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Everybody knows heartbreak, isolation. Everybody got worried Everybody knows sorrow, devastation